I'd actually like to start with just um, a few comments on the Internet Society, um, for those who aren't familiar with our organization, and it will certainly help put context to my later remarks. And before I do that, um, I would like to acknowledge um, .se uh, for being the host of Internet Days here. It's a great event, and we're very, very happy to also say that they are one of our organizational members, and we look forward to working even more closely together in the future. So the Internet Society is dedicated to the open development, evolution, and use of the Internet. Not for its own sake, but for all the wonderful and often surprising benefits that the Internet brings to all people. We were founded by two of the fathers of the Internet, Vint Cerf and Bob Kahn, and Vint actually served as our first executive director. Our vision is the Internet is for everyone, and we are active at the intersections of technology, policy, and education, and we also assist with Internet development at both policy and technical levels in emerging countries and regions. The Internet Society is also the organizational home for the Internet Engineering Task Force, for the Internet Architecture Board, and the Internet Research Task Force, the IETF, IAB, and IRTF, for those of you who like uh, acronym SOUP. Um, virtually everything we do online today, though, is because of the work of the, the IETF and its constellation. Virtually everything. And a number of you um, are here that have actually served in key leadership positions. I managed to just see a few people in the lobby before I came in, so I'm certain to have missed someone. But in particular, um, Curtis Lindquist is here, um, Patrick Falstrom, and I think Peter Lothberg is as well. Um, they've all held key and leadership positions um, in the IETF. And then for full transparency, um, in 2002, the Internet Society founded the Public Interest Registry. It's a domain name registry for all the .org, top-level domains. And while PIR is a separate company with their own board, they're organized as a supporting organization of the Internet Society. And their surpluses come to ISOC to fund our activities, and the bulk of our funding actually comes from that revenue stream. We're governed by an international board of directors, and there are a number of individuals from Sweden that have served on that board. Ava Froelich serves today. Patrick Falstrom and Austin Framberg have served um, in the past. As a global organization, the Internet Society has five regional bureaus. They're instrumental in addressing regional issues, mobilizing local support for global efforts, and developing policy and educational awareness. And Frederick Donk is actually here today. He's our European Regional Bureau Director, based in Brussels, and he's actually on a panel later today focused on net neutrality. Our regional bureaus are vital conduits for interconnecting our chapters, members, and staff. We have more than 55,000 members and 89 chapters around the world, with another 22 chapters in formation. The Internet continues to evolve significantly, and in any such situation, challenges will arise. One of the Internet's greatest strengths has been its distributed, decentralized nature, and this strength will be just as important for its future growth. The distributedness is where all of us, as well as ISOC's members, chapters, and bureaus, all have a very important role to play. This is the only way our efforts will scale against what I must say are some pretty serious challenges, not the least of which are some of the cyber warfare challenges. So by way of example, here in Sweden, we have one of our oldest chapters, which was made possible in 1997 by, as the chapter itself says, those people who connected Sweden to the Internet, thereby making Sweden one of the first countries to have a very significant Internet population. And many of those individuals are here today. And as it truly is always dangerous to single out individuals, given one inevitably misses someone key, I'd simply like to say thank you to everyone who has participated in making the Swedish chapter a reality. This applies to the leaders, to the founders, to the members, and to those all too critical people in the background. It takes everyone to make a successful chapter. So thanks are also due to the Swedish government, who recognized early on the importance of internet institutions, and have been supported and involved just enough, allowing the internet, the greatest communications network ever, to flourish. And as a real-life demonstration of how the internet community evolves organically in response to community requirements, the Swedish Internet Society chapter, as Danny said, was also central to the establishment of .se, the country code top-level domain registry, 
as well as Telematikens Utvechling, with uh, apologies for the pronunciation, the TU Foundation, which is home to a number of other critical organizations. Again, we're thankful that some of them are organizational members as well. I would also be remiss if I were not to take this opportunity to thank Austin Framberg for his service. Austin has long served as a chair of the Internet Society chapter of Sweden, and as I understand it last week, he announced that he will be stepping down as chair effective early next year with the annual board election cycle, um, partly um, to make room for new blood, which I think we would all agree is important for revitalization of any organization. So thank you, Austin. Sweden also has a number of firsts on the international stage. Having been connected to the research network, NSFNet, in 1989, it went on to become the first country to host a root server outside of the United States. That was in 1991. And in 2004, .se was the first TLD to implement DNSSEC. Not the first CCTLD, the first TLD. And Sweden continues to lead the way today. And more on that in a few minutes. Next year, the Internet Society will celebrate its 20th anniversary, which is quite a long time as Internet institutions go. And we have many exciting activities planned that will lead up to a multi-day INET event in Geneva in April 2012. So please do watch for announcements as we will be looking for broad participation, global participation in a number of events and activities. And the best way to participate will be through the local chapter, and I know they would like to see significant numbers of new members, so please do contact them. The Global INET Conference will focus on many of the key issues that confront the Internet's development. We look forward to bringing together thought leaders from around the world to share their insights and perspectives. While two billion people today use the Internet, we face daunting challenges to ensure it will be just as accessible to future generations. Many of these people will come from emerging economies, and we have a responsibility to ensure that they can enjoy the same benefits from a global, open Internet that we all enjoy today. In fact, I'd go further. We all have a responsibility to ensure that all countries of the world are on an Internet par and not merely advancing. Today's online users have high hopes and expectations for the Internet. Earlier this year, the Internet Society conducted a poll of Internet users from around the world, and 9 out of 10 people believe that the Internet has a critical role in fostering economic development, ensuring environmental sustainability, as well as solving many other important global issues. This was a general survey, not a survey of Internet users. A very significant proportion was in emerging regions and in countries, which make those um, findings all the more impressive. And perhaps even more interesting, a greater percentage thought the Internet was going to be even more important for addressing global issues in the future. As a platform that intrinsically enables new developments, the Internet is eminently suited to address current and emerging challenges. It was designed expressly to enable all ideas to flourish. So how do we ensure that the Internet itself flourishes, that it remains a global platform for innovation, economic development, and social progress? We have to start by looking at what makes the Internet of today so powerful. The Internet is first a creation of individuals and of its users, you and me, and it is all of us, independently and jointly, that determine what the Internet will be. As individuals apply their creativity and skills to the development of the Internet and new services, other Internet users take advantage of them. Those services that individuals want thrive, those that don't, they don't want, vanish. The Internet is characterized by user choice. None of the creators needed or asked permission from a central authority to develop, or even more crucially, to deploy them. And while this, this may seem very natural today, it was a revolutionary idea in the telecommunications world, and not all that long ago, and it continues to scare some, even today. The open nature of the Internet supports many very different services, different business models, different motivations. Just think of the World Wide Web, Google, Twitter, Facebook, Skype, Wikipedia, iTunes, um, all quite different, and yet all easily supported because of the open global nature of the Internet and because of open standards. And even more wonderful, these services in turn shape the Internet itself 
and the world we live in. Think of the impact played out so recently in the Arab Spring. There are literally thousands of stories like these, some more successful than others, but what each of the stories has in common is that none of the creators needed permission from a central authority. This permissionless innovation is a key component of the internet and a critical success factor in the internet's growth, yet it is increasingly under pressure. At the Internet Society, we're committed to ensuring that the internet continues to be open and to grow and to evolve in harmony with users' needs and interests. The internet's influence on the people and the societies that it has reached has been profound. It's interesting to note that before the internet, the computer networks that existed were essentially islands, cut off from each other and limited in their scope. But the early pioneers of the internet understood the potential of interconnecting networks and information systems. They understood that tapping that potential required a new way of thinking and working. The like-minded enthusiasts who built and managed the internet in its early days not only worked to develop technical standards and establish the basic functionality of the internet, but they also helped shape the spirit of the internet. One based on the principles of sharing, open access, and choice. Critically, and central to its success was the fact that it was built on open standards. This quickly evolved into a philosophy that embraced open, participatory management and governance structures and reflected principles of freedom of expression, access to information, as well as other democratic processes with a broad community of stakeholders. What I've just described, what we call the internet model of development, has been and remains absolutely essential to the internet's invention, to its futures, and to our future. It ensures that all internet users have a stake in the internet's development. By virtue of the open technical architecture, the open processes by which it is developed, and the distributed responsibilities and roles in its administration and operation. This model has produced one of the most extraordinary periods of technological development, innovation, creativity, and economic and social development in all of human history. It is easy to forget this model in the excitement of today's new services and new applications, but we shouldn't become complacent. Within this model thrives a diverse ecosystem of stakeholders with different roles, expectations, interests, but united by a common need for and responsibility to a global, trusted, accessible internet. As in any ecosystem, every component is vitally interlinked to the health and sustainability of the whole. So, so far, this all sounds quite positive. But we mustn't become complacent and ignore the warning signs on the horizon. There are no guarantees that the internet we value and appreciate today will be here tomorrow. There are challenges that shake the very core of what has made the internet so remarkable, and forces that have the potential to undermine the internet's stability for the billions of people lining up to join our online community. So let's look at just a few of these quickly. One challenge is the increased attempts by certain governments around the world to control their citizens' access and use of the internet. Oftentimes, this action is taken without regard to the basic principles of human rights and due process. And this applies to developed and developing countries alike, and is even more disturbing in developed countries. The number of countries taking actions or attempting to pass legislation in this area is frankly astonishing and very worrisome. To the broader point, the Internet Society welcomed the decision of the 18th Human Rights Council in September to accept the proposal made by the Swedish government for the creation of an expert panel on freedom of expression on the Internet. We applaud this proposal and look forward to the ensuing discussions that will focus on ways to improve the protection and promotion of freedom of speech in line with international human rights law. The internet is an essential vehicle for promoting freedom of opinion and expression, including the freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers, as enshrined in Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This article encapsulates the very essence of the internet and its borderless nature. The internet is an enabler for the realization of a wide range of human rights 
and internet freedom is the embodiment of the freedom of expression. Unfortunately, the same technical develop developments that give voice to billions of people throughout the world are also used by some to infringe on their citizens' basic human rights by restricting access to the global network, sometimes in the guise of security, other times commercial or intellectual property interests. We fully recognize the responsibility of governments to protect their citizens and enforce their laws, and also that there are misuses of the internet and illicit online activities. However, responses to these challenges should, as a first principle, not be assumed to be different from the offline world, and they should, in all cases, be based on due process and the rule of law. For example, DNS blocking and filtering are two of the solutions used increasingly by some to block access to websites for various reasons. Other measures used include surveillance technology or suspension of internet access. And yet we strongly caution against resorting to technical restrictions to solve what are fundamentally non-technical problems. Such actions threaten the foundation of the global internet as a single unified communications network, as well as raises concerns with regard to respect to due process, freedom of expression, and other human rights. Another serious threat to the future of the internet is delaying the move to IPv6. IPv6 must be deployed to ensure that the billions of people yet to come online are able to participate in an internet that retains the core technical architecture and all of the advantages that brings of the internet of today. In fact, that applies to all of us, not just those people or services coming online in the future. To not aggressively deploy IPv6 is to consciously walk away from all the benefits the internet can so clearly give us. I understand that the Swedish Minister for Information Technology recently introduced the digital agenda, which incorporates many excellent initiatives, including the goal that services provided by the public sector are to be reachable with IPv6 and protected by DNSSEC by the end of 2013. The digital agenda reflects Sweden's foresight in planning for the future of its citizens and sets an admirable example for others around the world. IPv6 and DNSSEC are among the many standards developed in the Internet Engineering Task Force, which has supported every aspect of the Internet's growth from its very earliest days. They do this through an open and collaborative process with all their output freely available online. The IETF is an ideal example of the collaborative spirit and of many of the principles that are actually at the heart of the Internet model. We all have a role, individuals, governments, private sector, civil society, to ensure the Internet of the future can deliver fully on its promise. The multi-stakeholder approach is instrumental to the Internet's growth and to its continued development as an open platform for innovation and economic progress in the developed and developing world. The Internet is about openness. It is based on an open architecture and open technical standards, an open, transparent, and collaborative management and governance models with freely accessible processes for its technology and policy development. It allows for innovation without permission and encourages a free flow of ideas and the exchange of information across borders. The Internet is one of the greatest catalysts of economic and societal development of all time. Whatever future political, technological, economic, and social challenges we may face, these core characteristics of the Internet must be preserved. They are essential to addressing these future challenges, as well as essential to the success of the Internet itself. Most importantly, we all have an obligation, again, to ensure the billions yet to come online and the generations that come after all have the same opportunity we do. So, ladies and gentlemen, while this Internet model has a much more subtle wow factor than some of the new applications being deployed, or even the idea of a red button proliferation treaty, <laughs> Um, it is the fundamental underpinning to all that is good about the Internet. And we are facing some of the most challenging times in its history, and the next year or two will be critical. The Internet model needs our collective care and nurturing if it is to survive. This is not an overstatement. Please do not take it for granted and do not let the Internet down. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you.
Så nu finns det tillfälle för frågor. Det låter alltid lite skrämmande här. Jag vet inte om vi kan ändra även på ljuset så att vi kan se publiken lite bättre. För jag kan inte se härifrån om det, om det finns frågor. Är det någon som har en fråga? Then I have a question. You talked a lot about cyber war and hackers. Um, the interesting part about cyber crime and how it will develop. Do you have some thoughts there to elaborate on? I mean, the point of the talk was really the, uh, the non-cyber crime aspects uh, of the threat. Uh, we really want to talk about the, uh, the, the more political motivated attacks. Cybercrime is by far the, the, the bigger threat. I mean, uh, crime on the internet is, is a huge business and, and it's growing simply because there's a lot of money to be made there. And, you know, as in some ways, I, I think uh, Sweden's a little bit protected by a language barrier. In most of the, the phishing emails come in English, in, you know, badly written English at that. And, I don't know how much actually jumps the language barrier, but certainly I think crime is the much bigger threat. You know, and you know, really my fear is, I didn't really say it in the talk, but, but my fear is, is very much that outside imposed security measures are going to change what the internet is. That when I look at the militarization of the internet, the, uh, the government's taking over aspects of it for you know, ostensibly security purposes, that they're going to change what the net is. And, you know, and crime, crime is definitely a problem, I, I, although I, I, you know, I don't want to either overstate it or understate it. it it's been with us for what, the you know, better part of a decade, and it's never going away. You know, but we are learning to deal with it. You know, uh, Countries are now much better than they used to be at prosecuting cyber criminals. Uh, <clears throat> security products are much better than they used to be. We're much smarter than we used to be. So I think we're learning to live with an internet where there is crime, just as we learn to live you know, in the real world, in cities where there's crime. <coughs> I, have the, I have the police uh, understood the principle of cyber crime. I think the police have gotten a lot better than they were in the early years when they had no idea what was going on. <clears throat> I mean, there, there are problems with prosecution. There are problems with, uh, with backtracking attacks. A lot of these attacks are international. A lot of cyber crime comes from sub-Saharan Africa or Southeast Asia or, or South America, where there might not be good computer crime laws, there might, might not be good police forces. So still, we have a very fortress mentality of security. We try to secure our own networks rather than go after the criminals, but more and more we are. I mean, the European uh, countries are organizing their cybercrime defenses. The, the police have gotten much smarter at dealing with cybercrime. And, you know, cybercrime is in some ways a, a, hard, a hard word because the boundaries are fuzzy. You know, you know, pretty much all crime now has some cyberspace component, even if it's, you know, two conspirators chatting on email. It doesn't make it a cybercrime. You know, just as if a bank robber uses a cell phone, it's not a telephone crime, it's a bank robbery. You know, so you know, the, the internet is the communications vehicle for, for all of us, both the good guys and the bad guys. And so when I think of cybercrime, I very much think of crime that happens on the internet. Mm -hmm. So it, it's financial fraud. And that, that happens on the internet. And there, yes, the, I mean, the, the police agencies are much better, and the banks are much smarter at dealing with it. There, there, are, there are better products, we have better authentication technologies. We're getting better at this. I mean, even Facebook's getting better at dealing with, uh, with hacked accounts. So, so we're all learning. Lynn, um, some people tell me that the internet and even the DNS has become uh, critical infrastructure. 
and it's far too dangerous to have it not re uh, regulated. Uh, what, what's your opinion about that? I mean, we start with a principle that says we ought to be regulating the uses as opposed to the actual infrastructure. Um, at the end of the day, DNS is a, is a piece of the management and operational infrastructure. Um, so I think that it's, it's ill-advised um, to actually step in with a heavy regulatory um, or government intervention model in what is essentially an operational infrastructure role. Mm -hmm. As I come from Holland, and, and in the 16th century, when you had an enemy coming, you just put a hole in the dike, and then you drowned the old army, and, you, and they couldn't go, go in. Uh, it's not the easy way with cyber war in the end, just to, to there's a cable somewhere, and you can, can pull the trigger, and you just make sure you, you can't be connected. Well, it, I mean, a couple of things. One, you have to make sure it doesn't do more harm than good. Mm -hmm. uh, two, that's easier in, in some countries than others. Or, you know, in, in, if you're in Egypt and, and, or, or, or some other you know, small developing country where you know, the president's brother owns the phone company and there's one cable out, I mean, yes, you, you can attempt that and it'll have better success than in a you know, modern Western country which might have hundreds of connections out of the internet. So, I mean, I think, and it, we saw this in the United States in discussions after September 11th, the, the after terrorist attacks, that, that the police should have the powers to cut off communication systems in times of crisis. And, you know, thankfully it's never happened. And those who study it, you know, see that it, it, it will do more harm than good. That, that we're not going to make ourselves safer by, by isolating, by cutting off the internet. The internet's used for too many important things. And, and the thing about infrastructure is that everyone uses it, the good guys and the bad guys. But the reason it's, you still have it is because the good uses far outweigh the bad uses. So yes, bank robbers drive cars. But you don't say, well, let's ban all the cars. I mean, yeah, it'll make bank robbery harder, but it'll make everything else harder as well. And that's the thing of infrastructure. It's there because we want it. And, and so you deal with the bad uses not by eliminating the thing, but by dealing with the bad uses directly. I know we all want to have, I want to ask questions, and I know also that you want to wait until the session is over, which is the Something. normal way here. Uh, so I'll, one hand there is there. one. Somebody up there. Brave there. one. <laughs> yes. Yes, sir, this is for, uh, oh. Thank you. Um, this is for Bruce. My name is Michelle, by the way, from House Supports Group. Um, what challenges do you see from a business point of view in the future when it comes to the security matters, um, server attacks, things like that? Yeah, I don't know if the challenges change. I mean, right now, I mean, all of us who, who run networks, whether we're businesses or, or you know, or, or non-businesses, have to deal with the, with the various the threats out there and, and making, the, making our networks work despite them. And I don't think things are changing. I mean, there's, there has been crime, there will be crime. You know, we're seeing you know, these, not, these uh, the hacker attacks and we will see them. I mean, I talked about these politically motivated attacks, you know, maybe they're on the rise. You know, when I look at the threats to the net, and it's what I said just before, it's you know, seemingly helpful things coming from outside our group. You know, when the government says, you will put in a kill switch, right? You will turn over management to the military. I mean, you will do this. They're, they're doing it because they think it'll help, and, and it won't. You know, those are the threats I see. You know, and, and they're less technical threats than the more political threats. But the internet to business, I think, I think things are about what they were and, and we sort of hit a, a social stasis. I mean, the technologies will change and there'll always be you know, new tricks and new products and new things that work and don't work. But on a broad level, I think we've, we've, the threats have stabilized. Okay, thank you. So you get, you, you get one, one question, there. you get them all. One there. It's one always there. the way it works. <laughs> so you should put someone out there whose job it is to ask the first question. 
Well, this question, uh, my name is John Flodin, ISOC and ISOC SE, by the way. This is question is for, for Lynn here. Um, we've seen a tremendous expansion in scope for the internet uh, over the years, and now our politicians are very eager to push for freedom on the internet, the usage of the internet, and so on. Do you feel that it is harder today to get them to listen uh, that it is important to preserve the core model of the internet uh, or do they just take it do they just take it as a tool it's always there we can count on it and we can continue expansion of on, on the usage of it is it harder to defend the core that is underneath all this i i do feel that it is harder to get people to to understand People take it for granted now. I mean, my nieces and nephews can't even imagine a world before the internet and before all this functionality, before all the smartphones. And yet those of us that were actually there in the early days understood just how radically different that was. And I think understood and maybe were somewhat fascinated by the principles that actually enabled that. But today they're, they're just taken for granted. And we see time and again, erosion of a lot of those principles and a lot of those values, as, as I said, in the nature of security or in the nature of protecting someone else's interests. And I think it's, it's hard for people to appreciate, and it's also a bit of a paradox, in that the way we will strengthen and, and address some of the challenges we see today is by leaning into the openness and leaning into transparency and allowing people to come forward with different solutions, not by restricting or hardening or locking down. Um, but, but to your questions, yes, I, mean, I, I do think it is getting much harder to, to both have people care about, and that probably starts with it's much harder for them to even recognize um, what are the things that gave us the internet. So I, I do. And I'm always open for suggestions if anyone can can think of some way to make that more appealing, <laughs> more sexy, more attractive, more exciting. Um, I, I certainly would prefer to be talking about it in a very different vein myself. So all suggestions welcome. <clears throat> there was a question there. In the... It's a question to Linz and Amor. Uh, you, ne you never mentioned the uh, legislation uh, proposal in the United uh, States called SOPA. Do you have any specific opinion on that? That's topic? what I was. Uh, yes, I actually think it's ill advised legislation. Okay. <laughs> so, so uh, do you, do you, did, did you do any official comments on it before? Or? We have, an, um, okay. sorry, we have a number of our chapters um, participating. We have a number of individual members. Um, we will be speaking out much more um, actively within the U.S. government. Um, honestly, when there was, there was a SOPA hearing last week, unfortunately, myself and a number of other key people um, that would have participated in events were in Taipei. Um, but we did have a couple of Internet Society trustees um, that were there on their own remit. So we will... <laughs> will be very active in, in terms of arguing against that going forward. Okay, thank you. <coughs> oh, yeah. uh, thank you very much. Um, I have a question for both uh, Bruce and Lynn. This is Emily Taylor, uh, by the way. This, Bruce, the sort of obvious examples of, of governments or military saying, you know, switch this off and things, they're sort of easy to spot. But I think that what Lynn was describing is a much more insidious nibbling away at internet freedoms, which can happen before anybody notices. And this is somebody, I'm, I come from a country where our prime minister stood up after riots and advocated cutting people off from the internet as the big solution and that drew praise from China. So um, my question to you is, how do we stop this insidious nibbling away at the internet freedoms that we all prize so much? Um, does it lie solely with the internet society and people like that, or is there something that we can all do? You know, I, I wish I had an answer. I mean, it certainly does lie with, with any groups like the internet society. These debates are not technical, they're political. 
And in the United States, you know, we, we have the same politicians you know, making the same sorts of arguments. And I think that the, our only solution is to, to fight for what we have. You know, and, and rights are hard because you often don't notice them until they're gone. And, and, and that's the worry. And there are you know, several groups that track censorship on the internet and, and publish reports on what various countries are doing. And I think these, uh, you know, the cutting off people and kill switches and uh, you know, demanding rights of surveillance and uh, data retention laws. I mean, th these are all examples uh, of nibbling away on internet freedoms, and they're all very dangerous. And I think we have to recognize them when they show up and, uh, and, and do our best to, uh, to beat them down. And this is what I try to do. But it, you really feel like you're being nibbled to death. Because, you know, I mean, and, and, and the London riot, the, the UK riots were a great example. I mean, something happens, and people who, who and they, they actually think they're helping. I, I believe, I don't believe they're, that they're trying to, to, to hurt the internet. They, they believe they're good, they're making it better. But because they don't understand it, they come up with proposals that just make no sense. Uh, proposals that, that try to ban anonymity are the same thing. I mean, China would love that also. And I think we have to use whatever political processes we have and whatever organizations we have to, uh, to, to beat them down. And it's going to be hard. And I think we're going to lose some. I agree. I think we need to be vigilant. And note I said vigilant, not we need to be vigilantes. <laughs> <laughs> um, somebody said last night at dinner that a few years ago there were four countries that were doing aggressive filtering. Uh, and today there are 44 countries. I mean, that's a very worrisome statistic, very worrisome growth. Last question. It's Jacek Gajewski. Uh, in the world of a normal crime, we have something like Interpol. In the world of tanks, we have NATO. So there are international kind of alliances for defense. Is there anything, something similar in, 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 in the cyber world that when one country is attacked, the other helps? Or I was somehow involved in Georgia conflict and there was nothing like this. And if not, which type of an organization would be good for this type of, a, let's say, alliance on defense? So you have to remember that the cyber world, the cyber world in some ways isn't there. It's the real world. So when there's crime, International crime, Interpol gets involved. Whether it's in cyberspace or not, Interpol gets involved. When one country attacks another, you know, international organizations get involved. So, so, so NATO will be the organization. Interpol will be the organization. There won't be new organizations. And I think that's best. I mean, the existing political structures are able to deal with the internet just like they can deal with, you know, mail. So, so, you know, we just need the organizations that exist today to become smarter, and larger they are. I mean, you know, NATO has, has written reams of, of stuff on, on cyber war and mutual defense. And, you know, maybe they're not getting it right, but they're working on it. You know, and Interpol is involved with international cybercrime, as they should be. So it's, it's the current organizations, not new ones. If I can just add, I think one of the worst things <coughs> we've done is prefix cyber. Yes. <laughs> just so many words. It, 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 it somehow implies that it's something uniquely different or a first off, and I think it actually prevents us from looking for solutions in, as you say, often the real world and an existing problem. Simply because something happens in a medium doesn't mean that it is a, a, a new crime or a new issue, per se. So um, I try and strike cyber <laughs> from my vocabulary wherever I can. Thank you, Bruce and Lynn, for this first morning session. You both will be around. <laughs>